Reading with your kids. Hey, 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 so great to see you. Come on in. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast, coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. You know, Reedville is often called Boston's Hidden Secret, and it's so cool. It is a part of the city, but we're, we're out in nature. There's actually a wildlife sanctuary that's bordering our property here, and it is a wonderful place, and it's a perfect place to introduce you to a wonderful series called The Nature Club, written by our guest, Rachel Mazur. Before Rachel joins us, I want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Dr. Connie Tate and her wonderful children's books, Scooter Boy, Roll On, and Sylvester's Catastrophic Tale. You know, Dr. Tate says it's summertime and it's time to read. Curl up with a book. There's no better deed. Reading is magical. Just open a book. You can travel the world from your own cozy nook. I know that you and your family are just going to love to curl up and read Dr. Tate's books. They're really, they're wonderful. And the characters you're going to meet are wonderful also. And roll on, you're going to meet Wren and uh, Rolling Spaghetti Squash. And, and Wren is inspired by Dr. Connie's granddaughter. In, in Scooter Boy, you're going to meet Cal, and Cal is awesome. And you're going to root, root, root for Sylvester's safe return and Sylvester's catastrophic tale. All of these great books are available on Amazon or at Lucky Jenny Publishing, Inc. And don't forget to check out Dr. Tate's website, RollOnReading.com. You can download all sorts of free activities. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by I Can Handle It by Laurie Wright. You know, if you're around kids these days, and, and if you're listening to the Reading With Your Kids podcast, I assume that you're around kids a lot. Well, if you are, you may have noticed that many kids don't realize just how capable they really are. Many children, uh, quite frankly, they haven't had practice solving their own problems. We kind of overprotect a lot of kids, and therefore they think that they're not able to handle their problems. Kids need to know that they are quite capable of handling situations they're going to encounter in everyday life, and, and that they're capable of handling the emotions that come from those situations as well. Practice handling their problems is essential for achieving success in the real world. Problems such as missing shoes and having to turn the TV off, wanting a pet or making a mistake. Kids learn best through repetition. And after reading I Can Handle It by Laurie Wright and hearing the mantra, I can handle it over and over and over again, they will identify with the child in the story, realize that they are just like him, and declare to all that I can handle it. You can learn more about I Can Handle It by Laurie Wright at her website, lauriewriter.com. Join us right now from right outside of Yosemite National Park. She is the author, and it makes a lot of sense that she's the author of a great middle grade series called The Nature Club. Please welcome to the show, Rachel Mazer. Ma Rachel, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you on the show. I am, uh, I just came in. Uh, it's a beautiful day here in Boston. Uh, one of the first beautiful days we've had in May. Uh, it's a really weird weather pattern we, we're in. Uh, but I was just outside with, um, Augie the Wonder Dog going around in our yard. And even though we live in the city of Boston, we live on the very outskirts and we live right next to a wildlife sanctuary. So our backyard, is big and it's filled with trees and flowers and wildlife. So it feels like I'm out in nature and not in the city. That sounds terrific. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's uh, we're really blessed to be able to bring our kids up here. So tell us about the Nature Club and what readers can expect to find. Okay. Um, so the Nature Club is a new series just released a few months ago targeted at ages 7 to 12, you know, basically the third, fourth, fifth grade group. And um, it's a five series. It's a, book, a series of five books. And each book is about one of the kids in the nature club. And it features one of the kids, an issue they face in growing up. And then their story runs in parallel with the story about an animal and the issues that they face in just 
you know, some sort of feature that they deal with in their life, whether it's migration or metamorphosis or finding natural food. And um, so in each story, these stories run paras- parallel. And in the end, the kids find ways to help themselves. They learn about the wildlife and then they also find ways to help the wildlife they love. That's fascinating. And I, it sounds like a really empowering series, uh, a, a great way to empower kids to make great decisions about their own lives and also empowering them with the knowledge that they can make a difference in the environment. That's yeah, that's right. Um, and I kind of started it when my own daughter had a nature club and just saw what they were doing. My kids are in the same age group. They're twins. Mm-hmm. Um, and and. I like to think about how humans and animals face things similarly. Yeah. I'm actually a wildlife biologist by trade and by training, and so it's a logical step for me. Talk a little bit, please, about the value of introducing our kids to nature. That's one of the things that I'm, I'm hearing uh, a lot from from authors and from families is that kids just don't have a chance to get out into nature that often. You know, they're always... They're, they're in program structured activities and they're on their screens and they're living in cities. So they're spending a ton of time in, in, in the back of the minivan and they don't get a chance to get outside and see the butterflies or climb a tree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's definitely something that's being talked about. I mean, it's good for your own health. It's good for your mental health, your physical health. Um, but it also bonds kids with the natural world in a way that makes them curious about it and want to protect it. So there's a lot of good reasons to get kids outside um, and then get them to really learn about it. Yeah. I've found that before um, when I was looking for books for my kids in this age range, there's a lot of books that are fact-based or kind of the encyclopedia type mm-hmm. book information. Um, whereas for the younger set in the picture book series, there's more books that are story-based. And, um, and I really wanted something where kids could just bond, whether they've spent a lot of time outside or not, they could dive into a story and have fun learning about the outside and the outdoors and about wildlife and get excited about it. Mm-hmm. That's, that's real important for us, I think, to, to get kids just thinking uh, about nature and the beauty of nature and, 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 and you can find nature even in cities. That's true. That's true. So I'm really lucky. We live right outside of Yosemite Mm -hmm. and my, you know, my day job, I'm the chief of wildlife at Yosemite. So I get a lot of nature and wildlife and so do my kids. But, you know, plenty of people I know live in the big cities, live in Los Angeles, live in San Francisco. Um, And they also have wildlife if they know where to look and if they take the time to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And, so you know, it's really important for people to know what they have and how to make a difference where they live, whether it's a huge wilderness area or more of an urban area that has um, a need to have um, pollinator pathways or, or whatever. You know, let, let's let kids appreciate where they are and make a difference where they are. Mm-hmm. You, you mentioned that, that term pollinator pathways. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that sounds like something that maybe we can do as a family in our backyard. Right. And, and, you know, it's so on my mind right now because the milkweeds are just popping all over the place up here. But um, book two is about monarchs and milkweeds, and pollinators are just in steep decline right now, and monarchs are in a horrific decline, just unbelievable. And it's really important that people understand what pollinators need in terms of using non-chemical solutions, but also making sure that they have the right plants and in the right areas that they need. There's been... um, really well-intentioned efforts um, to plant milkweeds where people planted sort of the wrong milkweeds that stayed in bloom all year and created problems for milkweed. So it's good to take some time to educate yourself, but it's a way everyone can be part of the solution and, you know, just get involved with a simple plot of land right out in front, you know, a potted plant right on mm-hmm. the front stoop is all you need. So, so just s- simply planting a, a, a plant that blooms can, can create that pollinator pathway? Something like that can be really helpful. Um, and in each book, I try to point out things that kids can do that go beyond pick up trash. You know, I think we always go to the default pick up trash, recycle, use less, and, you know, how often, or ride your bike. And we just hear those things constantly. But there's a lot more things than that that you can do that are simple that will make 
a difference. And so, um, like in book one, we talk about birds and migration and it runs in parallel with a little girl that moves south and she's very shy and she has to find a way to make friends and she moves south as the birds are migrating south and just kind of learning what are the challenges birds face in migration and how can you make windows safer for them? How can you make sure your cats aren't causing a hazard for them? That kind of thing, excuse me. And book three, we're talking about bears and raccoons and how animals get into people's garbage. And that's all running in parallel with a girl that's having a junk food habit and Mm -hmm. just how easy it is to get into food that's unhealthy for you. And how just with a little bit of effort, you can make your own body healthy, but you can also make it healthier for the animals outside to not get into that human food and not go down that trail of habituation. Um, You know, another book, there's a little boy, and he's the one member of the club that lives in Nicaragua, and he comes up to visit them. And he's really struggling with figuring out how he can make a difference in the world because he's just a kid. And um, and he comes to visit, and they find a bobcat that's been um, poisoned by eating a poisoned mouse that was eating rodenticides. And you learn all about food chains and how we can make a difference because we're all related. Mm -hmm. And that's more things like, well, how do you make your house so you don't have to kill rodents? Well, you seal up the cracks, you know, you uh, make sure all the food crumbs are cleaned up. So each one has really tangible things that kids can do to make a difference that goes way beyond um, the basics. Although we also want them to pick up trash. (laughs) Absolutely. Yes. And ride their bikes with their helmets on. Was, right, helmets on and lights on. <laughs> you know, you were talking about migration. We, Our property is on the migration route for, I, I don't know what type of bird it is, but it they always stop here in the fall and in the spring, and, and it's just, you never know, but you just walk outside one day, and there are literally a million birds in our backyard, and it just, it's a beautiful sound. It's loud with all the birds talking to each other, but it's just, it's just amazing, especially for me who, you know, a guy who grew up in the city to, you know, kind of uh, be out and experience that. I remember the first time it happened, I was I, I was a little bit afraid to see all those birds outside my door. Uh-huh. Yeah, it, it is. There are, you're not There's definitely people that are afraid of birds. But, yeah, I mean, birds are in decline as well. I mean, there is some good news on the front. We have found in a lot of these big protected areas that we – have been monitoring for several decades that the birds are actually doing pretty well in some of our protected areas. But outside of that, it's really important that we um, reduce our impact on them because it's not just the footprint and the habitat lost. It's smashing into windows and power lines and all the different things that they face along the way. But they're so beautiful. I mean, how can you not like this colorful little thing that sings? I I agree. We have this little teeny weeny little yellow bird that comes in and makes its home in one of our trees every year and and it's just and i we just love sitting out on the deck and watching it you know kind of fly around the backyard it's that's just it it feels like a blessing yeah they're just really they're sweet little creatures can you talk about oh go ahead sorry i just i i just learned recently that condors are expanding their range back toward us so we've got little sweet birds and we've got huge impressive birds. It's yeah, yeah, fun. we we have some big 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 hawks and eagles here too. Can you talk a little bit about the connection between nature and and good mental health especially when it comes to kids, you know, we kids we we talked about kids being structured all the time and looking being overstimulated by those screens and how beneficial is it just for kids to get out there and be in nature to kind of de-stress and enjoy themselves? Rachel will be back to tell us a little more about the importance of getting out into nature. But before she does, I want to let you know that this episode of the podcast is also brought to you by With the Courage of a Mouse, the first in the Superhero School series. Cat the Cat wants a home, a family, and friends she can count on when suddenly she finds herself in Sweet Meadows a long way from the alley she calls home. Cat discovers that she can talk, but she can't decide if she's dreaming or dead. 
Simon, a mouse, is having the worst day ever. Instead of celebrating his first day at superhero school, he's on the breakfast menu twice. A uh, hawk considered him an easy meal, but quick thinking changed that. Now a cat wants to pounce. Well, not if Simon can help it. With a quick plan and a matchstick, Simon speeds towards certain death. Will he arrive at superhero school safely? Join the entire superhero school gang with their first adventure with the courage of a mouse. The Superhero School Series Book One, a middle grade chapter book for ages 7 to 12, focusing on courage, friendship, and finding the superhero inside all of us. The series touches on common life themes and challenges with humor, patience, and self-improvement techniques. The Superhero School series is written by Donna Sager Cower, and it's available wherever books are sold. The screens and how beneficial is it just for kids to get out there and be in nature to kind of de-stress and enjoy themselves? Right. I mean, that's an excellent question, and that is by no means my area of study. Um, I can only refer to all the studies I've read and how everyone looks and feels and sounds when I'm around them when they're which out when they're outside, which is just joyful and stress relieving. But there's certainly a body of literature out there showing how important it is to get kids into that unstructured play and just mm -hmm. out in the fresh air and away from the screens and the buzzes and the stresses and the deadlines. So yeah, how did you? get into not only writing about nature and writing the nature club series, but also just dedicating your career to, to nature. Um, you know, I think that's a good question. At one point I wanted to be a landscape architect and I found that I really just, that was almost the opposite of what I wanted. I really like things wild. And so to try to design, things not only was I not very good at it but it just wasn't it wasn't the way my brain works and what I really enjoy so um I think in 1989 I did an internship at Zion National Park and I just loved the big wild spaces and then from there really branched into the wildlife wildlife end of it um and then it's just hmm. Yeah, I mean it's just it's been a it's been a great procession where I've gone from like big wild areas to wildlife to really wanting to teach kids about wildlife and then wanting to make sure what they learned was right. Mm -hmm. And the first book I wrote is called If You Were a Bear and it's a children's picture book. And I can't remember when that came out. It was a while ago. Um but I found there were a lot of books about bears for kids, but none of them were exactly right. Mm -hmm. They either had biology wrong, the pictures were wrong, something. And so I thought, oh, okay, I'll try one. How hard could it be? <laughs> and I learned it was actually quite hard, but it was a lot of fun. And I did a picture book, and all the proceeds go to environmental education. And the illustrator, Serena Jepson, is now an endangered species coordinator for the Xerces Society. And we had fun with that. Um, but then I kind of moved into more science and research and wrote a book for adults called Speaking of Bears. And that's a book about the history of bears and bear management in the Sierra. And that was a lot of fun to write um, because so many inventions and crazy stories happen in the Sierra that have led to all kind of, you know, movements forward in bear management throughout the country and the world. Um, but then I think it's so true. You kind of get back to your comfort zone. Like at some point I started with the kids, loved the kids, you know, moved more into the adult zone in the research. And then I had my own kids and you kind of circle back into the joy and, and importance of having them have a stake in their future and an understanding. And so um, I would like to say, though, what really got me going on this particular series was um, a woman I work with in Nicaragua. And her name is Salvador Morales, and she is a partner in conservation. She works on protected areas in Nicaragua and is a researcher and, you know, born and raised there and has two kids. And I just was so struck by, you know, there the birds are wintering and here the birds are summering and we simply can't do this without each other. Mm -hmm. And I got fixated on wanting to write a book about that bird that's migrating back and forth and really, you know, where does it live? Is it our bird that's spending part of the year there? Is it their bird? You know, obviously it's not. It's its own bird. But, you know, we we tend to take ownership of these animals that are migratory. 
And um, from there, it kind of led into a series and, and just morphed. But that was the original impetus, was just the fascination with migration and um, just really the importance that we work as a team with our conservation partners throughout the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the, the, the things – one of the things I'm hearing as you're speaking is is – this is a great way to not only introduce our kids to nature, but also introduce our kids to the understanding that we are connected as a world and that what we do here in in Massachusetts or California can have an effect on people who are living either positive or negative, can have an effect on people who are living in Central America or South America or different parts of the world. And um, I, th- I think that's a very important lesson for all of us, for especially especially for adults, not only for kids. I think so too. I mean, just the idea of trying to keep a neighbor. I mean, even if forget nature and just think of your own safety and thinking of places where people literally live in a bubble in a, some sort of gated bubble, mm-hmm. and things are kind of decaying around them. You just can't function that way. You need a functional community. I mean, even beyond the fact that it's not fair, it's sad, whatever. It's just, it doesn't function. You need a whole system where all parts are integrated and, and working. And whether it's our air, our animals, you know, soils, whatever, if we don't all take care of it, we're, it's just not going to work out well in the end. Mm-hmm. What kind of reaction have you been getting from kids who experience the series? It's been, it's been really fun. Um, The best for me have been kids that have told me that they have now started their own nature club. Mm -hmm. They've taken it that step further. So that I think the the stories of kids starting their nature club I love. And I've also gotten pictures of kids reading it to their younger siblings. And those are pretty meaningful to me. Cool. Well, I, I, you know, we, we talked about getting kids outside and some, and, and not always being in structured situations, but sometimes some kids need that little kind of extra encouragement. So uh, if, if there's a parent listening and they want to start a nature cl- club with their family or with their neighbors, what, what kind of things can folks do to get that, to get that ball rolling for kids? Um, yeah, thanks. That's a good question. I, and I love that you said there's different kind of kids, different personalities. I tried to get that. The five kids in the series all have very different personalities and different struggles, different family backgrounds, um, different hobbies, you know, different sports they like to do and um, issues that they're facing. Um, so some kids would like free play outside, but for some they can't, you know, mm-hmm. for, for various reasons, some kids need do need the structure. So, um, if you go to our website, which is natureclubbooks.com, um, there's a link for how to form your own nature club with some ideas there. Mm-hmm. And um, what I have also gotten from people is they've showed me, especially the, um, there's a lot of homeschool parents that are putting together entire curriculums. And some of them have sent me where they'll take one book and put together an entire lesson plan around it. So they'll, you know, say, okay, we're going to do, the bird project, then we're going to actually go and do something where we fix our windows or we plant plants or we do pick up trash or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to take a visit to, you know, this place where there's bird migration going on and watch them and try to see a nest, et cetera. Other people have gone to visit horses when they've read the book about horses and trying to put a whole lesson together or some kind of visit that would be appropriate with what's happening. With my own kids, I have found, you know, the the attention span is limited. So it's good to do, you know, think of the age group you're working with and maybe have an activity that lasts an hour. You know, hit it hard, but make it kind of quick and have them do something where they have a meaningful impact. And then on top of that is the free play or the adventure or a visit to some local researcher. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I, I just love being out in nature. Um, we had, uh, my wife and I had a chance to visit Panama over the, uh, last summer and had a chance to get out into the rainforest. And it's just, we just live in this absolutely beautiful world and we're surrounded by nature, by animals. And I, we don't see enough of it. We, we really don't see enough of it. And it'd be great. Not only for our kids, but also for us, I think, to get out there and and be more connected with nature. 
I, I would have to agree. And if you get a chance to go on a trip like that, that's terrific. And if you don't, one of the things you can do is just take like a little string and go outside and make a little loop in the garden or out in the field or whatever. And just in that little loop, have the kids see what they can see and have them really take the time to see what insects or grasses or soils are there. And that can be an adventure too. Yeah. One of the things that just blew my mind one day was I, I sat down and started thinking about all of the, you know, we, we host international kids in our home. And I goes, isn't this great that we have these kids from different countries living in our home and that becomes part of, you know, becomes their home too. And then I was sitting in the backyard and I was just looking around and going, Look at all the creatures that call this home, too. It's just uh, 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 mind-boggling sometimes. It is, and I have to say that sounds like a lot of fun, what you're doing. I would love to do that one day. It It, it is, and it's... Um, it's very rewarding. Anybody who has a chance to, to host international kids in their home, um, we've, we've probably hosted a couple, a dozen kids or more, and it's always been a great experience. And, um, uh, yeah, I'll just put that plug in there. Um, it's, it, it's easier doing it when you're in a city like Boston that attracts a lot of international students. But uh, the, the kids that, that we've had, they've all become part of our family, and they stay in touch with us, and they come back and visit when they come back to the States. So um, it's real special. That sounds, that, yeah, that sounds terrific. Earlier in my, you know, not my writing, but in my regular career, I hosted um, interns from Mexico and Central America for about a decade that would mm-hmm. come up and learn all our techniques and, um, and then head, head back and use them to do conservation work. But I would say it was definitely one of the most rewarding parts of my career to date. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just to bring it back and make the connection, one of I, very early on in our experience hosting international kids, we had a couple of young women from Japan with us, and the first time they went in the backyard, they saw a squirrel, and it like their <laughs> mind exploded. They were so excited, and we're like, "No, those are like rats with big fluffy tails." <laughs> but they're like, "Oh, they're so beautiful." <laughs> But I bet it got you to see it in a new way. It did get us to see it in a in a in a new way, and uh, we're really happy for that. And I'm really happy that you've created the Nature Club so that kids can kids and parents, I think, can can start to see nature in in a new way. And this is definitely a series. Um, you know, our middle grade kids, we often, you know, we're like, oh, they can read by themselves and they don't want to read with us. But I think this is a great series to experience together as a family, whether you're co-reading it and then talking about it later or reading aloud together, because I think it's something we can all benefit from getting out, becoming more aware of nature. You'll never learn everything there is about nature. If you're a curious person, that's one field that there's always going to be something new for you to learn. And I think it's a great way to bond with your family. It's great for your mental health, great for their mental health, and just a lot of fun. So um, I'm really, really happy that you've written this series. Thanks, and thanks for having me on to talk about it. I'm excited about it, and I hope I hope kids get something out of it. So the, the, the Rachel's website, again, is natureclubbooks.com, and you can go there, and there's a whole lot of information. It really is a great website. We've been talking today to the author of The Nature Club Books, Rachel Mazer. Rachel, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be illustrator extraordinaire John Power. He is here to tell us about his latest book, One is a Pinata, a book of numbers. That's the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Hey, if you are the author of a fantastic children's book, we would love to have you as a guest on the podcast. Being a guest is fun. It's easy and it gives you the chance to tell the world about your fantastic book. All you need to do is to go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com, click on the contact button, let my producer know about your great book. We will let you know the next easy steps. We would like to thank Rachel Mazur for being here today. We also want to thank our fantastic sponsors, With the Courage of a Mouse, the first in the Superhero School series by Donna Sager Cowan. We also want to thank Dr. Connie Tate. Be sure to check out her wonderful book, Scooter Boy, Roll On, and Sylvester's Catastrophic Tale. 
And also, we want to thank Laurie Ryder. Her book, I Can Handle It, will give your children the confidence to know that they can handle all the situations that they will encounter in life. I, I, I can't forget to thank my producer, Fatima Khan, for everything she does. Make sure you check out her blog. Every time we publish an episode of the show, she puts up a fantastic blog at readingwithyourkids.com. I also want to thank my beautiful wife for all of the support that she gives me. And, of course, we want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Podbean, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you find your podcast. I also want to thank you for helping to make the world a better place. You know, you do that every time you read with your kids. I'll be looking for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.